Yes, I prepared a little input about the welcoming culture or the receiving culture in Germany. Uh, so it's very specific about the country and about the current policies and the culture that's there. So the term welcoming culture, which is Willkommenskultur in German, uh, maybe some of you have already heard of it because it's uh, <laughs> because it's quite, I think a lot of news picked it up and a lot of newspapers talked about it as well. So in general the term uh, welcome cult welcoming culture is used to describe uh, Germany attracting mostly skilled workers. That was the intention in the beginning. Um, however, during the migration summer of 2015, a lot of refugees came to Germany and a lot of accommodation facilities had to receive uh, refugees and were not very prepared, prepared for that. So uh, many citizens uh, reacted in different ways. There were a lot of uh, negative reactions, uh, even racist riots. Uh, but there was also great and unprecedented willingness to assist refugees and to volunteer in refugees and refugee homes and asylum shelters. Uh, the term was appropriated uh, during this term to describe a welcoming culture, uh, which is also uh, presented with the banners that probably some of you know, uh, Refugees Welcome, um, and uh, it is a term that has now been appropriated by the civil society and mostly private initiatives, even though it originally came from the state. So since 2015, Willkommenskultur, or welcoming culture, is a term that most Germans know and that most Germans associate with receiving refugees in particular, also migrants, but mostly uh, refugees. It means to have welcoming culture and welcoming policies. So it's not only the civil society, but also politics that are supposed to act here. And it especially pertains to attitudes of businesses, uh, politicians, educational institutions, and the general society. Secondly, it expresses the wish that all immigrants should be encountered without discrimination and that they should be accepted in Germany. Um, I will now give you a brief overview over a study and then also contrast it with the actual policy in Germany right now and draw a brief conclusion. So um, I will not go into the depths of the study, but I want to highlight before I talk about it that the only study that I could find for 2017 is highly problematic. Um, I think there are some, in my opinion, there are some um, prepositions that they used and some methods that they used that highly skew the results and highly bias the results towards more positive outcomes than I think are true for Germany. So this study, uh, for this study, 2,000 people were asked about their opinion uh, on how other people react to immigrants with work or study visa. So immigrants that are supposed to be attracted by this welcoming policy, but also refugees. Some of the most illustrative findings uh, are that one third believes that immigration is a good means to remedy the lack of qualified workers in Germany, and that uh, refugees and immigrants can be beneficial to the entire economy. 79% share the opinion that immigration is quite a burden for the social welfare state though, and 72% agree that immigration causes conflicts, especially in schools, the education system, and also on the housing market. And keep this in mind because I will talk about it later again. 72%. Uh, 55 people, or 55%, sorry, uh, also do not want Germany to take in any more refugees, mostly because they think that Germany is at its maximum capacity to take in refugees. However, 81% uh, uh, would approve of a European system of burden sharing and uh, highly, um, highly in favor of, an, of a quota for European countries to take in refugees. Three out of five people, however, do not even want to take in any more refugees for humanita humanitarian reasons, which is quite striking, I think. In total, positive attitudes towards immigration and positive consequences from the influxes of the refugees uh, are losing points in all studies that we can compare from 2012 and 2015. Negative attitudes, however, have flourished since the last studies in 2012 and 2015. I will now talk about the contrast of the real policies and the real culture in Germany. Um, and I would like to say that, uh, as I said in the beginning, I will focus on politics, businesses and the labor market, as well as the education system. And I think this picture that I'm going to paint is rather unpleasant and incongruent with uh, 
what we think about the welcoming culture. So de facto, there have been a lot of cutbacks in the structures and in the rights of refugees and immigrants. For example, uh, when we talk about the high housing that is provided, uh, there are very many pre uh, precarious provisional refugee camps. For example, in tents, in gyms, or in containers. There are a lot of mass refugee camps. Uh, there are dormitories, community shelters, and emergency accommodation with little to no private uh, space. Uh, in the 1990s in Germany, we had a discussion and basically an abolishment of the right to asylum. Uh, it sounds a little bit drastic, but the German Basic Law, which is kind of the constitution of Germany, actually has a right to asylum for political refugees. Uh, however, in the 1990s, because of a lot of right-wing uh, protests, uh, pressure and extremist uh, racist violence, some of those rights were cut back seriously and refugees uh, were started to be demonized as welfare system parasites. That's the main discourse that emerged in the 90s and it's also still very active in today's debates. Um, also, Germany established safe neighboring countries and safe third countries and was a strong advocate of the EU's Dublin system. Uh, some a policy that is more recent than this is the construction of safe, um, safe countries of origin even. There's a list of safe countries of origin, and the refugees that come from these areas uh, have serious cutbacks <coughs> in their rights to claim asylum. Uh, and the investigations of the individual cases and situations are shortened to speed up the procedure in general because Germany has received so many refugees. However, this does not ensure adequate rights of these refugees. Uh, then also immigration matters in general in Germany are linked to the Ministry of the Interior which is constructed hand in hand with security policies and most of the debates are about the restriction of immigration and the restriction of family reunifications. Then Germany to my knowledge is the only country in the European, Un European Union that actually restricts the right of movement of uh, immigrants and of refugees in particular. Uh, it restricts the human right to freedom of movement which I think is quite noteworthy if we talk about the Schengen area and the general idea of the free movement of people across, even across national borders. Uh, even though Germany, um, all but two federal states in Germany had abandoned uh, policies like that in 2015 or before the immigration summer of 2015, uh, fixed abode, constraints of residence and residence obligations have recently been reactivated and reinstalled. Uh, uh, in the entire country, not only in those two states that they had done before, but also in the entire country. And that means that the federal government in Berlin actually decides on a place where each refugee has to go and where he or she has to live for a minimum of three to five years. That means for refugees who had come in 2016, because this was the year when they changed this, um, that people that already had settled had to go back to the places, municipalities, cities, smaller communities where they originally had been sheltered when they arrived in Germany and then were uh, distributed to other regions as well. Um, it required them to move back and to be separated from family members that they maybe had, uh, to leave behind friends and social contacts and also quit already secured housing that they had. And if people already had jobs, they needed special permissions to keep their already found jobs and not to move to a different area. Uh, this newly installed system ensures that even remote and sparsely populated areas, which in Germany are often um, dominated by the far right, the very many areas, I have to say, uh, it's, it's highly problematic because these areas are already unattractive to uh, local people. A lot of people already move to cities and don't want to stay there because of the climate, uh, the social and political climate, etc. Um, but for those immigrants, especially for people of color, it is really dangerous to go to these areas and it can be even endangering for their life. Um, I would like to briefly show you this slide. It's not very visible, but it starts in 2012, uh, in 2014, sorry. And in 2014, we actually had one attack on refugee homes each 36 hours. In 2015, we had 1,049, and in 2016, there were 10 attacks each day, which makes for almost 4,000 attacks on refugee homes. Um, oh, sure, sure. I will give this one. Um, 
I will briefly say something about the labor market and education and come to my conclusion because I know we have a limited time frame. Um, I just want to highlight for this right of movement that refugees in some areas, when they leave the county or mun municipality they have been ordered to stay in, um, this is being registered as a criminal offense. So actually leaving the place that you're supposed to live at is, is considered to be a criminal offense. So they are criminal offenders then. Um, for the labor market, there was a priority check or priority review, which has been suspended for three years in 2016. That means uh, that the wealth, it was originally meant to relieve the welfare system in Germany and to fix the shortage of skilled labor. The requirement of German credentials for many jobs, however, makes it very difficult for foreigners to have their credentials uh, acknowledged in Germany and it protects especially high-skilled German workers and, the, uh, and actively is meant to discourage from economic migration as well. It furthermore refuge forces refugees into the least skilled and low-wage labor sectors by denying the acknowledgement of their education on already achieved professional certificates and credentials. This can, for example, mean that somebody that is already a molecular biologist, for example, has to work as cleaning personnel and has to maybe study again, has to do a lot of tests, has to learn German, etc. And it can take up to 20 years until this person can work as a molecular bio biologist again. And if you're an older person, that's not very easy to do, to wait for 20 years just to do the job that you've already been doing in your country of origin. Um, so for education, children of immigrants and immigrant children are highly discriminated against by teachers, but also by the uh, system that we have to select for higher education and secondary schools. Uh, immigrant children and children of refugees are also being rejected from applying to schools that allow for entering university after graduation, which is a serious problem. And uh, it is justified, justified based on constructed cultural and social backgrounds. And then I think the most shocking thing is that many children who do not yet speak the German language are being sorted into special needs schools which are completely cut off from the regular education system and completely cut off from higher education as well. So as I mentioned in the beginning, 72% of Germans think that there are uh, areas of conflict in education, housing and the labor market. But from what I could tell, uh, looking at these findings, I wonder what exactly there can be said about negative consequences for German people. I only see negative consequences for people that immigrate to the country. So my conclusion, uh, for my conclusion, I want to highlight one more thing. Uh, in fact, voluntary and civil society's action, action taking does in fact influence positive attitudes as well. So many volunteers uh, most likely will continue to support refugees and they also have achieved uh, better condition in the refugee homes and housing facilities by pressuring local authorities for better conditions within the camps. However, I think it's problematic that civil society carries out many of the functional capacity that usually the state is supposed to carry out, uh, such as, for example, communication and translation, providing language classes and providing language training, which is not standardized, um, accompanying refugees to administration office, offices or government agency, agencies, sorry, um, supporting and finding accommodations, providing public transport and the provision of often necessary private transport if there is no public transport, especially in sparsely populated areas. But they also do medical, psych, me, medical and psychological tasks uh, as well as legal counseling, people without training as, as far as they can do. I think the withdrawal of the state responsibilities illustrates the symptom of the neoliberal privatization in this area as well. And as a consequence, we have informal and civic structures of activated volunteers who, however, provide these services spontaneously. So they are not trained to be medical or legal advisors. And they lack professionalization, unfortunately, training, knowledge, and standards. And also, this uh, provides a justification for the state to further cut back the services that they provide, because they have tested it as successful, since the civil society will carry out those functions for them. Um, to, I think to end my, my statement here, I want to say that the large group of volunteers and welcome groups, however, has shown that the people that engage in such voluntary commitment um, are very much trying to actively build a more inclusive, inclusive and open society and shape society towards a different um, perspective. Thank you.